Hello and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project webinar. This afternoon, we're pleased to be discussing President Biden's executive order on foreign controlled apps. My name is Nate Kazmarek. I am Vice President and Director of RTP. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion on this program are those of our speakers. Today, we're happy to have with us Matthew Feeney from the Cato Institute to serve as our moderator. Matthew is the director of Cato's project on emerging technologies, where he works on issues concerning the intersection of new technologies and civil liberties. He previously worked at Reason Magazine, the, Conserv the American Conservative, uh, Liberal Democrats, and the Institute of e Economic Affairs. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Matthew and our panelists today, you can visit our website. That's uh, uh, regproject.org, R-E-G project.org, where we have all of their complete bios. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Matthew. Uh, once our panel has completed their discussion, we'll go to audience Q&A. So please think of the tough questions you'd like to ask them. Audience questions can be submitted by Zoom uh, using the raise hand function, and we will call on you directly. With that, we are excited for a great discussion. Matthew, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Nathan, and uh, thank you all for, for joining. I'm excited for this uh, conversation on uh, a topic that I think is increasingly on, um, on everyone's minds. Uh, some of you may remember during the Trump administration that uh, the president signed a number of executive orders uh, aimed at certain uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese owned apps, the most popular perhaps being TikTok. And what we've seen during the Biden administration is uh, the revoking of the, the relevant orders and the imposition of new orders. And, and I think this uh, raises an opportunity for all of us to discuss uh, the national security risks of these um, social media apps, as well as uh, the role of executive orders and the executive, uh, the process uh, surrounding how these are signed, um, and also how the current controversy uh, may um, affect commerce, privacy, uh, and uh, other important features of our ongoing relationship with China. Uh, we have an excellent panel here uh, today to discuss these issues. Uh, what I've asked the, uh, the, the panelists to do is um, when they first uh, speak is to briefly introduce themselves and to, to mention their, um, their expertise. And as Nate mentioned, if you have questions, feel free to throw them into the chat or to raise your hand. My, my goal here is to make sure that we have at least the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Uh, so with that, I thought I would start with, with Jennifer uh, and, and ask about what, what are the kind of risks we're, we're talking about here? What do we know about how uh, foreign adversaries use American data? Uh, what about TikTok is particularly uh, concerning and uh, what new and emerging technologies and techniques like AI are being used? Matthew, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Jennifer Hay. Uh, I serve as the Senior Director for National Security Programs at Data Robot, an enterprise uh, AI uh, platform. Uh, previously, I served in the Department of Defense um, and have held positions in the National Security Council staff as well as at senior levels at the, the Department of Defense. Um, in terms of how AI is being used by our adversaries, we can take China as a perfect example of what they're, they're doing. It's a country that has no um, issues with being able to collect data. They're not concerned about privacy of their citizens or anything like that. And so they have the ability to gain access to um, billions of, of of da data that they can use um, to target their US, to target their own citizens, as we've seen what they've done with facial recognition in the Uyghurs, um, using that to identify um, you know, members of the Uyghur population and be able to target them, put them in jail and, and things like that. And there is a concern that they may be able to do that uh, with US data um, using platforms via TikTok uh, and WeChat and other various different platforms that are being used by, by citizens outside of, uh, by individuals outside of China. Uh, and being able to use that data the way, as people know, artificial intelligence is, is dependent on, on vast, amounts, vast amounts of data. So the more data that, that our adversaries are able to collect, uh, the better their AI will be, the smarter the AI will become. Um, this is important as China has 
uh, announced that they want to be the president, Xi Jinping has announced that he wants to be the leader in world AI uh, by 2030. And in order to do that, he needs, he needs data. And collecting data from uh, worldwide sources uh, is key to that. Um, as we as AI becomes smarter, um, we're currently, many people are, are doing research on what we call artificial uh, general intelligence, which that's the AI that they make movies about. Uh, we're not there yet, but um, getting that AI to think, they need access to, to vast amounts of data. So while we think that TikTok is just a platform where you can record your children lip syncing to Lady Gaga, in reality, China would be able to access that data uh, and use that information to, to improve their facial recognition as well as their natural language processing. Um, and then also, specifically target individuals that they want to target um, in terms of national security purposes. Uh, that means that they can, can target um, specific individuals that they want to um, either recruit for intelligence purposes or create intelligence um, applications targeting you know, US, US citizens. And so that's all stuff that we want to avoid. And what we do know about the way China operates is that um, they, their civil military fusion um, is much different than it operates in the United States, where here we have a direct, we have a, a split. There's essentially a firewall between, between that one. China, uh, the military and the PLA can can um, compel Chinese companies to turn over their data for national security reasons. So even though um, we may not have, you know, TikTok is not owned by the PLA right now, there is evidence that, that the PLA may request data um, from platforms like TikTok uh, and WeChat in order to, to further their, their AI. We saw a little bit of that with, with Grindr. People may have remember um, this story um, back in 2019 where CFIUS, um, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US compelled Grindr to, uh, compelled the Chinese company that owned Grindr to, to sell off its US portion of it because um, there were Chinese engineers that were accessing the grinder data uh, and that we were concerned about the national security implications of that. So I've gone on a little long, but um, I'll want to turn it over to, to somebody else. But, but there's really, we're really concerned about how the data can, can be used um, by the Chinese government. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I thought um, your comments um, prompted me to think of a question for um, Professor uh, Jaffer, actually, because I, when when you think about the the scale of the, the issue here, I think the um, the scale of executive authority comes to mind. So maybe, uh, Professor, given your your work on on national security, could you I guess give the audience an idea of how much authority does the executive branch here have to um, mandate either the sale or the prohibition of commerce with um, foreign owned businesses? Uh, what's the scope of that authority? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, and it's and I have to say it's somewhat unclear, right? I mean, I think that the um, executive orders that we saw um, uh, coming out of the administration, um, in many ways, the last administration, in many ways, were, were unprecedented um, in scale and scope. Now, obviously, um, the the government we have we have laws and rules around uh, investments into the United States, um, and and be, and requiring a companies to divest uh, or 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 prohibit transactions. Uh, where if foreign investments coming in, that's the entire CFIUS regime, uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, and in this case, of course, at least with, if you think about like, for example, the, um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the WeChat acquisition, right? There they, 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 uh, they acquired, uh, sorry, the TikTok acquisition of Musical.ly, right? Which is an American company. Uh, there they acquired an American company that was not a CFIUS review, was not submitted for CFIUS review. We, re we we require that to take place uh, voluntarily. It's required under law, but it takes place at the at sort of the request of the purchaser. That didn't happen. They made the acquisition, um, and then and then later on, we sought to sort of unwind it through this through this process, um, or at least look at it for consideration to be unwound. Um, and then, but then what you saw was a really interesting effort by the administration to sort of force. Uh, uh, the divestor of all their U.S. properties, right? Which is primarily the musically acquisition, but but there could have been more. And so, uh, in, in attempt to sort of leverage their access to the U.S. market, right, um, um, in that manner. And so, um, in a lot of ways, the the claim scope of authority is is both breathtaking, 
but also critical to national security. Um, and so, um, so it's really it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. We know now, obviously, that's, that President Biden has withdrawn both the WeChat and TikTok executive orders. There's now a process ongoing over the next six months um, to try and figure out what they're going to do and what tools they're going to utilize uh, to effectuate the same goal. They do seem to have the same concerns, right? I mean, I think it's worthwhile to talk about, as Jennifer did, um, and as I know Margaret May uh, going forward, you know, what those concerns are, right? Because a lot of people out there are, are saying, you know, I don't get it, right? Why is it that the U.S. government cares at all about some dancing videos of kids, right, on TikTok? Um, and, and, and so what? So the Chinese have access to it. Great. They have access to the data. Why does, why does that matter, right? Why should we care? WeChat, all right, I get it. You know, there's, it's a messaging platform and maybe have access to what's going on in there. And they want to use it as a means of control in their own population. And maybe they want to ex you know, expand that over here. Fine. That WeChat seems to make a lot more sense to people. But TikTok weirds people out, right? And, and they don't really understand it. And I want to sort of highlight, you know, part of the reason why this is raises such important concerns. And I think Margaret, having actually lived through some of this, can actually really give you some detail on it. But from my perspective, right, part of the thing that's going on here is you have to remember that the Chinese are collecting huge amounts of data, as Jennifer pointed out, right? We know about uh, their, uh, their, their now well understood attempt to, or, or successful attempt to take um, huge amounts of data about American security clearance holders, right, through their, uh, through their uh, uh, attack on or, or, or successful infiltration of the Office of Personnel Management. Again, by the way, that was not a cyber attack. That was just really good cyber intelligence collection, right? If we could have done it, we would have done it too, right? They obtained huge amounts of data on all of our security clearance holders. Um, but that's not the only one. We've now publicly disclosed that the Chinese, the Chinese government, was responsible for Anthem, right? They're responsible for Marriott, right? They're responsible for one of the big credit uh, rating agencies. So that, that they have a large amount of data on Americans, American citizens, American green card holders, right? People in the United States, a vast trove of data, right? In addition to whatever they're natively collecting, right? You add on to that, right? What's happening on, on platforms like TikTok and WeChat and who these kids or their parents are friends with, who they share videos with, right? How they behave in those videos, right? And the like. And now you're talking about huge amounts of data combining together. So it's not just this one TikTok thing in isolation. It's the combination of all the data the Chinese government is collecting on Americans, right? And how that data might be tied together and utilized, not just for the data itself, but for how that data can train supervised machine learning algorithms, right? So you can, you can attempt to identify how, be, how, how, how people might behave or who they might talk to or who they might communicate with, right? Because you can see who their connections are here, You've got their entire credit reporting record. You've got their, some of their hotel stays, some of their health records. You've got some of their uh, data about where they've lived, who their associates are, who their family is, right? Very detailed reporting about their travels, right? And when you combine all that information, that's where it becomes really powerful. And so it's not just WeChat or TikTok in isolation, which is important enough of, on its own, but it's the way that data can be utilized in combination with the other data sets and to train this sort of larger machine, larger scale machine learning AI database. So I think that's why it's important. And that's why while, while these claimed authorities by the government are very aggressive, right? And very strong and, and might have some questions on in terms of their legal footing, right? I think it's critical as, as President Biden now looks at this and decides how to do it. He recognizes the magnitude of the threat and they take very clear direct action to ameliorate that threat, whatever methodology that might be through. So let me stop there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for all that. Um, I, I think that's um, given all of us a lot, a lot to think about. Um, I, I would though like to turn over to to Margaret because uh, I know that she obviously um, will have some views on on what's been discussed so far. But uh, I also think it might be worth um, discussing, perhaps, Margaret, the the process of these EOs. You know, what what perhaps goes on um, behind the scenes, the, impl um, the implementation of them, um, and then also feel free to um, add any any thoughts that you have on um, the other comments so far. Great, thank you. And I know you had asked us to give a, a brief intro at the start. So I, I will just say that I'm currently in academia. I'm teaching at George Mason Law and Texas A&M University in their master's program. And before that, I had worked in all three branches of government at the federal level, uh, clerking for the Fifth Circuit, worked on Capitol Hill, worked in the executive branch for two different Republican administrations. And I worked at two global US companies. So I do have a perspective on, on how data is produced, how that's used and valuable for business, and why there might be some very legitimate concerns domestically on who has access to our data and, and even more pressing concerns when a foreign adversary has the data. But let me answer your question about the process. So when I, when I, when I hear your question, I hear two parts. One could be what was the process of the Biden administration in producing the EO? 
that is less interesting to me because the administration would have a lot of leeway in the process that they used. Um, but in terms of the process that um, President Biden's EO lays out, I think in many ways it's addressing some of the concerns that came up in the court cases immediately following the Trump administration's EO. And in that way, when you read when you read President Biden's EO, you actually hear her use very adoptive language. He talked about the ongoing emergency declared in Executive Order 13873, which was a Trump administration EO. So that's a, a continuation of policy. And as someone in this space, it's actually nice when the US can have a very consistent, predictable, continued policy with somebody who's been declared a national security competitor by the national defense strategy, and somebody who is determined to be a foreign adversary by the Department of Commerce. So the process that is laid out in the EO is um, thorough. And I think that bodes well for the cases that are ongoing, which I know um, the DOJ has asked many of them to be stayed and the ones that may come once these determinations happen in December as Jamil mentioned. So the process is interesting because it lays out eight factors and what I loved about the factors is they really focused on whether or not there's control, whether or not there's influence, whether or not there's ownership, whether or not there's management by a foreign adversary. And three of those eight factors specifically use that language. And all you have to do is read China's very own 2017 intelligence law to say, check, check, check for those three because it, the language is very clear in article seven and 10 and 18 that says, all organizations and citizens shall support, assist, and cooperate with national intelligence. So imagine if you had that, that requirement on US companies like Facebook, and Twitter, and PayPal. That's what we're talking about here, except we're talking about what I like to call a real, real data hogs. The truth of the matter is TikTok was downloaded 2 billion times in 2020. It had reached 2 billion downloads in 2020. That's more than Twitter, LinkedIn, Reddit, and Pinterest. TikTok has 689 million active users. WeChat has 1.25 billion. And Ant, which is the financial services, Alipay, so think of it as the PayPal equivalent, has 1. Uh, or 1.3 billion. So when Jennifer and Jamil talk about this is the issue of the data, we're talking about true data behemoths. One of the, the, the stats that I read recently was that Ant, which is the Alipay, um, and, and WeChat actually has a WeChat Pay feature as well. Uh, they have more users outside the US, so non-Chinese citizen users, than PayPal has globally. So we're talking about not just a scale of access to data, but to Jennifer's point, we're talking about people who said, we're gonna be the world leader in understanding so what about this data? I mean, you can have lots of data and if you can't parse through it, then, um, then it's not really concerning or impressive uh, other than just a general liberty concern. But the point is, is you're talking about people who are saying, when it comes to 5G, we'd like to lay the infrastructure for a 30% discount around the world. So we don't even have to hack into your telecommunication system. We're just riding alongside your information. Then as many of you as we can convince to opt in to our apps, we'll get your data that way. And then we are going to be the world's experts on knowing the so what about the data. So if you, if you think about this and you think, okay, that's all in the hands of a foreign adversary, that's a very different feeling than when you think about, well, Facebook has a lot of users. Yes, they have about 1.8 billion daily users. That's a lot. Twitter has about 10% of that, 187 million daily users. But imagine if you took PayPal's 361 million, Twitter's 187 million, and Facebook's 1.84 billion, and said, those aren't three different companies anymore. That's the US government. And we're going to do what we'd like with the data, how we'd like it to include policing, and as Jennifer said, we'll sort you on the basis of religion and send some of you to camps. And so that's the risk that we're thinking about. We're thinking about what does this mean for US citizens? What does this mean for our allies? And quite frankly, what Jamil said is critical. They are learning on our data. 
we're helping them be better at attacking us and understanding us by the access to this data. So, data. So, sorry, that's a little bit of the Alabama accent coming through the data. Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess I would say that the EO has a, a process that I think will have improved uh, experience in the court. And uh, we'll see how the process goes. They're, they're still at the beginning of it. Um, but I did wanna touch on this issue of the data we're talking about isn't 17 videos. That might be what you're uploading, but what the what the Chinese government is downloading is massive. And they're they're 300 and um, they're having a complete circumnavigation of your life. If they're getting your social data, your work data, your communications that are happening over um, Huawei systems. Thanks. Uh, th yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, I, I want to uh... Uh, invite Jennifer and Jamil to, to jump in if they want, but I'll just use moderator's prerogative to just ask um, what, um, what the panel, I mean, anyone can feel free to jump in, but uh, what are we to make of at least the, the supposed you know, reassurances of um, TikTok, ByteDance, the executives and these companies who have tried to reassure Congress and uh, American lawmakers by saying, look, you know, the data isn't even housed in China, you know, it's either housed in the US or Singapore or elsewhere. Um, all of this kind of raises the question of, you know, is there any degree of reassurance that these company executives could make or the Chinese state could make that would um, alleviate any of the concerns that you've all outlined so far? No. Okay. Um, so I, 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 I said, all, I said all jokingly, I mean, I think, like, I mean, I think the, I think the challenge here, right, is is that um, well with WhatsApp with with uh, WeChat? Sorry, I said WhatsApp, but with, with WeChat, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the there's no there's no there's no pretenses about what's going on with the data, right? Everyone understands what WeChat is and what the what the design and what it's aimed to do. And in fact, the Chinese government effectuates a lot of its sort of policies uh, as we were talking about through these social uh, these social credit scores and the like that uh, WeChat helps effectuate. But on the TikTok front, they have made this claim, right? That, well, you know, the data is stored elsewhere and it's all fine, don't worry about it, it's all good, right? But, but, but you know, as, as, as Jennifer and Margaret both pointed out, right? They're subject to very clear, right? Chinese law, right? And it is what it is, right? I mean, you you know, they're a, they're a Chinese company uh, and they operate in China and they have to comply with that law. Now, whether whether or not we think they should or they shouldn't or whether they, they say they will or they won't or the data is somewhere else, right? The reality is what it is. Um, and, um, you know, it, you know, not to draw out a current analogy, but trusting the Chinese government on this front or these companies that are heavily Chinese influenced because they have members of the Chinese Communist Party on their board of directors is like trusting the Taliban to keep up their commitments. It's stupid when you do it. It was stupid when the, when the Trump administration did it. It was stupid when the Biden administration did it. They shouldn't have done it. And the Taliban didn't live up to their, live up to their commitments. The same has been true at every turn with the Chinese government when it's come to these type of issues. We keep, you know, it's, it's like it's like playing Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football, right? Eventually, you got to figure out that it's not going to work, right? You can't trust these folks, and you've got to act accordingly in your own national interests. The Australians have, have figured this out well ahead of us, right? We kept footsing around while the Australians actually did the right thing on Huawei. We talked about it, talked about it, and, and finally, we were pushed into it by our own allies, right? And we've now finally brought the British around. They kept, they kept playing the game of Charlie and Lucy around the football when it came to Huawei. Finally, the British have come around, albeit too late. BT's, BT's already got... Huawei in their networks, um, you know. So I think I think at least on the on this front, it is worth saying that trusting the Chinese or their companies is not a route to success. At least that's my perspective on it. But I'm interested in Jennifer's thoughts. I, know, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you said, Jamil. That I I come back to the fact that there is a law that compels um, these companies these companies to, to provide any data as requested by the Chinese government for national security purposes. And that could be anything. Um, so they have to turn over the data when, when the government requests it. Um, and that's, I get stuck on that. Um, and, and do we really wanna trust, as Jamil said, do we really wanna trust the Chinese government to, um, to allow these CEOs to uphold these commitments that they've made to the US government? Um, I, don't, I don't see that, that I don't see that happening um, in reality. So for me, the, the risk is is still there no matter what what they say. Um, I had a uh, a question associated with one of the uh, the, the Trump executive orders, the the, the one that um, targeted WeChat, because there was you know a federal judge did did block at least some of it, I believe, on at least um, 
on First Amendment grounds, right? Saying that there were, you know, First Amendment interests of US citizens at stake here with something like this. So um, if, if any of you have thoughts on that, I'd be interested to hear them because it strikes me that, um, you know, that certainly national security concerns, but aren't there also concerns about uh, Americans who are using um, these services to communicate with each other, to share their thoughts and to engage in other First Amendment protected activities? Yeah, I mean, I saw that ruling. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not sure I agree with with the ruling, right? I mean, this idea somehow that um, that we're limiting U.S. person First Amendment rights by by prohibiting the use of a particular platform, right? I mean, it's not like there aren't plenty of alternatives out there, right? And um, it's not like uh, in this case, I believe if I, I don't remember if this if it was the TikTok, TikTok case or the WeChat case, I thought it was WeChat, but I could be wrong. Um, but it's not like you don't have alternative mechanisms, right? It, 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 um, the idea that this is some significant restriction by restricting the, 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 the sale of a particular platform, I think it, it's, it's, I saw that ruling as a stretch, but you know, uh, I don't know if Margaret or, or Jennifer has thoughts on this. I think I would agree with Jamil. I saw it as a stretch because you're, the right to use a certain app is not one that is a well-established right under the First Amendment. And so it starts to take you down that path, right? That's like saying, you know, what if they had required MCI to sell off a piece of it and now they're forcing me to go on, you know, a Sprint telephone. I don't, I just don't understand how that would be um, something that would be upheld. So I I don't have it in front of me. So as a lawyer, I'm content to, to, to to speak to the case, but my my instinct was I didn't I didn't follow the reasoning. Does um what does the panel think about the I suppose the 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 unique features of social media here? So obviously, you know, we, we're using all of these uh, platforms to um, to share personal information, to express thoughts. Uh, the companies collect all kinds of data about you know geolocation, age, race. Uh, all the rest of it, political affiliations. Uh, but uh, obviously, you know, social media is not the only industry that is collecting a lot of data on people. Uh, so you can think that, you know, there are, there are Chinese companies engaged in, you know, smart city technology, ro robotics, uh, other, other uh, industries, of course, use all kinds of artificial intelligence. So is, is there an argument to be made that there's something kind of unique about social media or uh, do you think that uh, maybe these executive orders didn't go far enough and there's potential for restrictions uh, with other industries? Because it strikes me as kind of interesting that they're just focusing on uh, social media apps at the moment. So if I may go first on this one. Um, sure. So I think the answer to this has to be really looking at China, what China has said about their strategic intentions, right? Again, they are determined by the U.S. government. They are... Uh, determined both by the Department of Commerce and by um, the DOD's uh, national defense strategy to be a com strategic competitor of the U.S. and to be a foreign adversary. So those are the two descriptions that we have formally of them. Their strategic intention is to become a world leader in these technologies. Their use of the technologies demonstrates that they believe control of the governed by their data is appropriate. I mean, one of the things, and Jennifer mentioned it, the data that they're collecting on the Hans and the Uyghurs and the Xinjiang province is really intimate. One of the things that they collect is how often the front door opens and closes. And so part of that is, I always think about it from a Bill of Rights perspective. If you can track who I'm assembling with, if you can track what I'm saying, I mean, go through our Bill of Rights and think to yourself, do they have access to the data where they can track and trace me in a way that if they wanted to intercept those rights, it would be very easy for them to. And then ask yourself, what have they said explicitly? I mean, one of the things that I admire about the, the uh, G's exuberance is he states what he's going to do. He, he states that we're going to be world leaders, we're gonna be made in China 2025, and then he proceeds to execute in a very public way. Two million Uyghurs in 308 concentration camps is to me a suggestion of how he looks at governing and how he looks at data. And he's moving that through his entire society through the social credit system. So 
when I say, when you say, do I think that it's under responsive? That wasn't your question, but that's how I heard it. Because there are these data concerns, I would say yes. I want to talk about telecommunications in part. It's because something I understand, having worked at a telecommunications country, the shift from 4G to 5G. I always say it's not just another G. It wasn't just another G. You go from having meter specificity in the location to centimeter specificity about where somebody is. So yes, I would be concerned who has access to whether or not my phone is by my head or by my heart in a way to interfere with a pacemaker or wherever else it is. I would, I would be concerned about a foreign adversary being able to pinpoint somebody's child in their insulin pump. Uh, and 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 how you know what inter what interference could occur, and you these concerns become real when you're talking about a foreign adversary, right? That's when you have to say, as a government protecting its citizen and working with its allies, what restrictions should we look at? So my concern about the um, President Biden's EO is not the process. I actually prefer the process this time this year. My concern isn't the criteria. I think the criteria are very sensible. Um, my concern is, is it strategically responsive to what the Chinese have articulated their intentions are? And is it strategically responsive to the concerns that we should have about all of these sources of data being vacuumed in by a foreign adversary when the foreign adversary puts on full display, this is what we do to people when we have this much data on them. And so I always like to say, these are not accusations, right? This is, I'm quoting back to you what their strategic intentions are and what their execution, their, their observable execution models are. And that's one of the things I think the US government needs to take very seriously. This is the Chinese have a full spectrum disagreement with us on the issues of data management, how people should be governed and where the person begins and the state ends. And we need to accept that. You know, people say when someone tells you who they are, believe them. This is very true in the strategic sense with China and Xi. Uh, I'd, I would, love, I'd actually yeah. love Jamil and Jennifer to respond to that if you can if you can turn to them. Oh yeah, please do. I'm just going to interject briefly to say um, to to the audience. Um, I, I am seeing the questions being thrown into chat. Uh, I, I promise I'll get to them in about uh, eight to ten minutes. But um, for the for the rest of the next ten minutes, I want to still focus on the discussion we have here. So yeah, Jamil, uh, Jennifer, please feel free to jump um, jump in if Margaret um, prompted any thoughts. I also agree that the EO doesn't. It's a it's a good start. Uh, we need to start someplace and, make, and focusing on social media because that is um, a current and immediate threat uh, because it is being used so uh, widespread inside the United States. But the EEO does, definitely does need to to expand upon to other other types of platforms. You know, I'm concerned about the surveillance platforms um, that they're developing. Uh, and their use of collecting data and then even you know, using AI. Um, and if those start to be exported to you know, police departments inside the US or um, even, even companies that you know, Amazon is creating the ability where you walk into a store and they immediately know who you are and they can target ads to you while you're in the store, uh, know what you wanna buy, you know, that type of surveillance technology and turning over that amount of data um, really infringes on, on our privacy and so we need to understand where we as citizens we need to be able to make an educated decision on how our data is being used who is using it and do we want to to turn over that data and part of that is to understand um how, like the company that owns these these applications and and where that that data can ultimately be ultimately be used. So I do think it needs, we've taken a step in the right direction, um, but ultimately as we continue to learn more um, about software and applications that are collecting data, um, he, you know, the Department of Commerce needs to be empowered to, to, um, to be able to, to look into to ultimately what is behind the scenes on, on these applications and software platforms. 
Yeah, and I'll just hit a different piece of what, what Margaret was talking about. I think it, I think she's exactly right to point out that this is not some sort of made up concept about where the Chinese are going with this and where, where this comes from. It comes directly from their strategic doctrine, right? And, um, you know, one of the, I think, the challenges the United States has, and I really do think the Trump administration gets should get credit for uh, their highlighting of the very real threat that China poses to our nation. I think that between their advocacy on this issue um, and, and the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic and the realization amongst American people about our supply chain dependence on uh, China for PPE and pharmaceutical precursors and the like, I think we finally have awoken a bipartisan concern um, about China and the strategic threat it, it, it poses to our nation. Um, but they've been saying this for years, for decades, right? They've been writing this and they're writing. And part of the problem is, uh, it's really interesting, there's a, there's a recent piece of legislation out there um, uh, that, that actually would um, would create a translation center um, to to take Chinese strategic documents in, in native language and translate them to English so that scholars in the United States can read them and and and, and talk about uh, and, and describe what they're what they're what they're writing about. We lack a real deep uh, seated understanding of Chinese strategy in part because we don't read and understand the language. Um, and you know they don't have that problem, right? Um, you know China has a lot of English speakers, and it's one of the benefits of, of English being the lingua franca of the world, right? At the same time. You know, we don't really understand fundamentally at a deep level uh, what our adversaries are thinking. And they've been telling us for years, as Margaret points out, we just haven't been paying attention. So it's good now uh, that we are paying attention. It's good now that we're engaged in this discussion, that we're rallying our allies around it. I worry uh, that it's very late in the process uh, to be getting to this point. Um, and they're well ahead of us. Um, and to be candid, um, you know, we're not helping ourselves in the global effort uh, to confront China as an adversary. Uh, because we are not doing a good job. And again, Afghanistan is just one example. Um, you know, it goes back to what the, what the Trump administration did with the Kurds, what the, what the Obama administration did with on the Syria issue. We are not making our allies uh, comfortable with us and that we'll be there to back them. And we are not making our adversaries afraid of us. And let, let's be clear, the Chinese and the Taiwanese um, and all of our allies in Asia and elsewhere around the globe are watching very closely what we are doing in Afghanistan, our utter failure as a policy matter um, what we did as, uh, in Afghanistan. And let's be clear, it was not intelligence failure. It was not a, and I know we're not here talking about Afghanistan, but it was not a logistics failure. It was not a planning failure. This was a decision made by policymakers, first the Trump administration, and then again, the Biden administration uh, about what to do. And everyone, China, our friends in Asia are watching, and it is not a good situation. Uh, we have a few minutes before going over to, uh, to, to audience questions. I do uh, want to ask though, uh, given that you know I spend a, a lot of time thinking about privacy, and when these um, EOs came down um, down the line, I, I remember thinking about with, whether uh, the executive branch was the correct branch of government here, in the sense like obviously that there is um, you know uh, for national security was within the remit of of the executive, but uh, isn't Congress around to maybe write privacy legislation to at least um, add some kind of protections here? I mean, is is the fact that we're even having a conversation about a string of EOs? A symptom of um, congressional failure or lack of um, movement here, or is this actually something that is is actually best placed within the executive purview? Uh, Sorry. So, so I do want to clarify that I'm not a lawyer, but um, in looking at the privacy implications to this collection of data, I think Congress does need to step in and create some sort of, of national regime for a pri privacy protection when it comes to collection of data. Um, because if we leave it up to the states to, to do it, then that is, um, that's 50 different, 50 plus different privacy regimes that companies need to comply to. And the inadvertent effect, the second order effect of that is that companies will have to ultimately collect more data than they possibly would have collected initially. Um, you know, for example, companies that don't need location information will now have to collect location information of their users um, in order to make sure that they're that the users are, are or that the company is complying with the user's privacy regime that, that, that governs them. Um, so my personal opinion is that yes, Congress does need to, to step in and start to have that discussion um, on what what does privacy mean when it comes to data collection um, and, and start to issue, you know, create some sort of regime for the United States? You know, maybe not as far as GDPR, but something similar is, is what we need. 
I think it's so interesting that uh, Jennifer has that has that perspective. I, I I I don't agree. I actually think that the that these issues are best sorted through in the private marketplace, right? Um, I don't think that we um, that we need to create this massive privacy regime. I agree with her. GDPR is not the way to go. There have been all sorts of problems with it. It it, it really, in a lot of ways, GDPR is not really about protecting European privacy. It's really about changing the game so that American companies can't be as competitive in Europe as they are today. Um, GDPR really doesn't effectively uh, uh, protect privacy in, in any substantive way, in my view. Um, and this idea, you know, all these states have these privacy laws, and now they're talking about federal privacy laws. The idea that the government can regulate or legislate in this space in any way that's effective with technology change so quickly to me is, is, is not realistic, right? The, the legislation takes forever. It's oftentimes both overprotective and underinclusive. Um, and, and technology moves so quickly. Been, and we've been so innovative, frankly, in the technology space and been so productive in the technology space precisely because we have not legislated and not regulated. Um, and the Europeans have been such a failure because that's exactly what they've done is a legislated and overregulated. So the idea that we should now come in and adopt the European approach on privacy or adopt the European approach on whatever, I mean, if we want to tank the American technology economy, okay. And I get there's a lot of conservatives who think, oh, it's a good idea to regulate big tech and, and, and platforms because we don't like how they're treating us on social media. And liberals say, well, it's not, they're not treating workers fairly, so we should regulate them. So there's this really nasty cabal coming together um, in a way that would that would sort of bring the government into private, into regulation, into legislating in this space of conservatives and liberals together, uniting over you know perceived concerns, right? And and really, what that's going to ultimately do is undermine our economic security, undermine our most innovative sector, and ultimately undermine our national security competitiveness because we're undermining what is at, at the end of the day the heart of the American economy and our national security establishment going forward. That would be a huge mistake. You know, putting members of Congress in charge of technology or worse bureaucrats at the FCC, that's a train wreck. We shouldn't do that. Margaret, any thoughts? Um, if not, happy to turn over to, to the audience for questions. Yeah, I have two quick thoughts. One of is to, um, this data might be two years old, but there was a review done in Europe on what the effect of the GDPR was. And what they discovered is that it was doing what Jamil said. Small and medium, medium enterprises were unable to keep up with the compliance costs. And so they saw a reduction in the existence of small and medium enterprises over there. So I think that that was an unintended consequences. I didn't think that, I don't think that was something Europe was trying to achieve. So I do think the, the regulatory concerns are significant in terms of how you could implement it. But what I find um, remarkable, and it's kind of ironic in a bad way, is that all of this debate and, and what Jamil called the big cabal coming together, this is how we feel about privately owned companies that resist to the hilt requests for information from the U.S. government. We are very, there are people in the U.S. who are very concerned about how much data Facebook has on them, how much data Twitter has on them, all of this data collection. And yet we're, we're stalling, we're stalling out on the issue of this adversary, this determined, both determined in the sense that it's been determined to be a foreign adversary and it is a determined foreign adversary to collect data on us through infrastructure and telecommunications, through acquiring US companies and through surveillance. And yet we, we, for some reason, don't exhibit the same passion um, to address that concern. So I would just, I would say we should address these in the order of greatest concern. And for me, I am more worried about a foreign adversary having information on me than a private US company having on me. And so for the people who fall in the category of being concerned about all of the above, um, it's remarkable to me that we are piecemealing, we're trying to piecemeal a response to a centrally planned attack. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I, I do want to uh, turn over now to some of the um, the audience questions. A reminder, you, you can throw questions uh, into the chat, but also feel free to use the raise hand function. Um, I, I'm gonna take these chronologically. Um, I wanted to start with a question from uh, Ethan Meredith uh, who writes, uh, do the panelists have thoughts on how the restrictions could be drafted to avoid Berman? Uh, I'm, I'm also not a lawyer, so I'm going to re reveal my ignorance here. I think this is a reference to the Berman Amendment, which has some um, implication I hope one of the panelists can, can outline. Uh, going on to write, uh, social media apps uh, seem to be particularly uh, 
facing difficulties re uh, the Berman as opposed to say financial apps. Um, do, does this prompt any uh, response from any of the panelists? Jamil, sorry, no, okay. Um, we can we can move on if there are no thoughts on that particular one. Uh, Jeffrey Wood writes, um, there is an inverse con uh, condemnation argument here. Uh, uh, the US federal government owes citizens and residents, aliens, uh, duty to protect their privacy, free speech, freedom of assembly, blah, 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 um, and permitting the, not sure I quite see a question there. Um, there's a, a comment here from Clay Albert about um, the concern sounding a lot like um, overstepping on know your customer and transaction tracking for cryptocurrency people in, in those industries. Um, I guess, it, you know, the, the, there might be a, um, a, a question in here that actually occurred to me in the conversation, which is um, how much data is it, um, what, what kind of data could these companies be collecting that wouldn't be concerning, but would also make them functional as social media apps um, or um, as, as alluded to in the earlier conversation, maybe there's no amount of assurance about data that's, uh, that would be um, reassuring to those of us worried about national security. I mean, I guess you sure. could imagine a world in which there were some limited amounts of data that, that they collected that you weren't as concerned about on the national security front. But the typical stuff that these social media platforms gather, you know, Matthew, you ran through a laundry list of them, right? Uh, location, um, uh, patterns of behavior, um, some content at times. I mean, these are things that, that when aggregated, right? And when aggregated in particular, as I described earlier, with other sources of data and fed into uh, uh, highly performant or, or, or make, to make uh, machine learning algorithms more performant, um, it, it's hard to imagine, you know, what you wouldn't, what you would be okay with them collecting, right? Uh, you know, I mean, I suppose if they were very transparent with what they collected and how it was being utilized and what it was combining with and yada, 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 you might get some level of concern, of, of comfort. But, you know, I just think at the end of the day, it's different than my perspective on, on American marketplace competitors who provide privacy policies. And, and look, if we wave, we wave, right? how many of us go on our phone every day and say, oh yeah, use my location whenever you want, however you want, whatever, or only when using the app. Well, I think that's a good one, right? Only when using the app, right? Use the app every five minutes when using Google Maps, whatever. So, okay, right? Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, it would be hard to imagine them functioning as normal commercial companies that collect a significant amount of data for your free app. Remember that whole idea that, you know, if, you, if you're not paying for the thing, it's because you're the commodity. Um, the old saw now at this point, um, you know, I, I, it's hard to imagine me being comfortable. I'm comfortable. Unlike Europeans, I'm comfortable with Google having it. If I tell them they can have it right. I'm not comfortable with the, with the Chinese government having it. Europeans have the same, have a different view, right? They're really comfortable. Their government's having it. They're uncomfortable with the private sector companies having it, you know, and it's a sort of a difference between Americans and Europeans, at least that I've perceived. So on this front though, I don't think any of us Europeans or Americans alike want the Chinese government having it. Great, thanks for that. Uh, th there's a question from uh, Elizabeth uh, Eason here about um, how much of the, the, the concern here that we've been discussing could be addressed via the Committee on Foreign Investment, um, if that's a, an appropriate body. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a, a body that any of the panelists have views on, but uh, you know, might that be uh, one way to address some of the concerns here? Or not? That's uh, that's fine. Um, well, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. No, sorry, I, I saw someone Margaret, speaking. But... Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I mean, that's ahead, one Margaret. of the. Cepheus is actually reviewing some of these transactions right now, separate from the EOs, and so that is a, a, a proper mechanism. I think it, if you ask me, do I think there are amendments? I would want to sit down with the Cepheus lawyer. Uh, and say, okay, what are the you know three or four things that we think we could do? My my observation of the Cepheus process, if you go back to issues like Qualcomm and others, is that it is a process that can be very cumbersome. And so, if we're going to send a bunch more traffic through it, then I think we actually have to look at you know the reform of how it works. But it is it exists. And it addresses some of these issues. And in fact, it's looking at some of the very questions the EO raised. So there may be a requirement for the divestiture to go forward under the CFIUS process right now. 
Um, and I think that that's something, I think that's a great recommendation to the Biden administration, which is how much of this are you going to try to do through EOs and under other authorities? And how much of this are you going to look at CFIUS, uh review? Because that's actually been discussed for years that there need to be improvements to the CFIUS process. But uh, I, I know Jennifer had some thoughts as well. Uh, I agree that I think that Taking a review of the CFIUS process is is important, um, but one reason why I liked the EEO is that I think it fills a gap um, that CFIUS doesn't cover at the moment, um, where it's looking at um, ap applications that are solely owned by a foreign government or, or, or by an adversary, as opposed to the adversary purchasing a U.S. company. Um, and so I think that that's, that's the in my mind, that's a delineation between this EO and, and CFIUS. Um, sometime in the future, I think, you know, doing that CFIUS reform um, and potentially looking at uh, foreign owned apps that are used inside the United States um, is something that CFIUS could potentially take on, um, but we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, and just to be clear, these would be amendments in addition to the FIRMA amendments that just happened about three years ago. So I just mm -hmm. want to point that out, that it just did go through a series of reform, but I, I don't think that it is, even with the firma reforms, capable of addressing all the questions that now we're trying to grapple with the DO. And part of it is just the, the traffic, the time that it takes to get through the process. Yeah, I, I see a, um, a, a question from Jeffrey Wood uh, about... Um, you know, he, he writes, I have, uh, I agree with the impulse of seeking a private market solution, but will the market protect US national security interests or only private economic interests? Is the proper model uh, import export controls? And does that invite a new mercantilism? Uh, and I guess I'll use that question to use moderator's prerogative to um, follow with my own, uh, namely that it, it, the, is there a risk here that um, we're inviting some sort of reciprocal response from other countries and we end up in a situation where, where well American companies make social media products for Americans and the Chinese have to make it um, theirs for for Chinese people uh, doesn't this um, potentially have an impact on uh, uh, global trade and uh, transactions or is that concern overblown I just I just I, I love this like you know this idea that somehow you know it's all reciprocal right let's be clear right? The United States and our government, when it seeks data, operates under a system of laws, a system of laws passed by a transparent process in the Congress, signed by the president, right, and put out in public for everyone to see, then implemented by judges who are appointed to life terms and whose process is also open for the public to see. When the Chinese operates, it's the exact opposite. There is no transparent decision-making process. There's just the Chinese Communist Party, right? And so this idea somehow that when we do something and we have we have surveillance laws or authorities or the like, um, and they have surveillance laws too, and, they, and they, you know, it's the same thing, it's not the same thing. And so when we decide we're gonna behave in a certain manner because the Chinese don't have a process that's transparent and understandable. And as a result, there's our data is being collected and used in ways that we don't, we don't know about or understand well, right? It's fundamentally different. It's fundamentally different when it's the private sector, which is not, doesn't have to give data to the government unless they're required to under U.S. law, right? Whereas there, the private sector and the, and the, and the, and the Chinese government are enmeshed. Members of the Chinese Communist Party sit on the boards of these companies. They're influential in the decision-making process of these companies. It is not the same thing. And so because we treat Chinese companies one way because of the way they behave, the idea that, that it's, it's, it's fine for us all except that they will or that our friends, our allies will treat us the same way, it's just not accurate. They're not the same thing, right? And so, yes, there's a possibility, Matthew, to your question, might there be reciprocal action? But is reciprocal action the correct and appropriate thing? And should we push back on it? It's a not the right thing. We should absolutely push back on it. Um, uh, the the questioner's question, though, uh, remind me again, Matthew, what the questioner's question was. I apologize. Oh, no, I, I should apologize for, for um, piggybacking off it. Um, the specific uh, question um, saying, uh, but Jeffrey expressed that he was um, in, in agreement with the impulse of seeking a private market solution. Right. But will the market protect US national security interests or only private economic interests. Um, I guess the question here is, you know, we can say that, that the private market um, solutions emerge, but how much do does that market yeah. care about national security? Well, I think that at least at least in this realm, there's a couple of places where they're aligned, right? On our, our, our economic interests are aligned with our private sector, right? Where our private sector is successful, right? The American economy grows. That's important for, the, for, for America in the, in the national security realm, right? Because as the Trump administration correctly pointed out, economic security is national security. We've always all known that. They put it in writing, right? Uh, and and, and, that, and I think that was correct. 
At the same time, right, you know, it doesn't mean we can't regulate the national security space. We can and we should, right? And we are sort of, there is a little bit of Merkelism going on. I do think there's a little bit of that going on when we'd say we're not going to allow Huawei in, right? Will that happen worldwide? Again, I think there's reasons to think it shouldn't, but I'd be lying if I said to you that wasn't what, a little bit of what's going on here, but the Chinese have been doing it for years. What do we think Huawei or ZTE is? That's literally Merkelism at large, right? We, we've been treating China like, oh, we're all working in the capitalist environment. They're playing fair. We're playing fair. It turns out we're just the idiots, right? Watching what's going on and not paying attention attention to what they're actually doing. They are not operating in a capitalist way. They're operating in a capitalist market, right? But but stealing intellectual property from us and giving it to private companies to prop them up along with low interest loans and the likes. This idea somehow they're playing fair and we're and we're just we're losing the competition. It's not true. They're playing unfair. We're playing fair and we're just the morons of the game. Um, Jennifer and Margaret, if, if you want to add, um, feel free to jump in, but I'm, I'm happy to, to go on to other questions. If, if no, I, I would like to, I'd like to reinforce something that, um, a point that J Jamil started, uh, and that was the Chinese government and how it operates, because I think it's really important for us to um, identify those points of intersection and so that it doesn't lapse into accusations, right? Because um, you don't set foreign policy on the basis of raw accusations. And so he talked about the fact that they have requirements to have CCP party members in the, in the businesses. Let's be clear, it's in the C-suite. I'm also aware from talking to people in US companies where there's a joint venture in China, they have been, there has been pressure for US companies to accept a C-suite level person from the CCP in the joint venture in China. I'm aware of specific examples of that. So there's that. Then there's the 2017 Chinese intelligence law that we keep referring to. And it's really worth, it's really worth reminding ourselves of what it says. You're an organization, you have to support, assist, and cooperate with national intelligence efforts. That isn't the same thing as the FBI coming with a request that you resist, then they get a warrant and you keep resisting it which is what our model is. So that's another example. Then there is the issue of Huawei and ZTE. And I wanna, be, I wanna make sure we all realize Huawei is in the US. It's in regional telecommunications companies. The limitation that was put in place actually affected the four major carriers at the time because of the way the prohibition was put into place had to do if you were doing work with the US government. So we have Huawei equipment, in, in US regional carriers at the moment. So the approach is a true belt and suspenders approach in terms of their access to information, their commitment to getting it, the number of ways they come in. It's the point I always try to make is we are beyond the place where they have to be good at hacking into our systems. They are in the backbone of the system. They are in the C-suite meeting. I mean, ask yourself as an American citizen how you would feel if the U.S. Congress passed a law that said, "Here we go, we're the we're we're a democratically controlled uh, bicamerally right now, and we're democratically controlled in the administration, and we're going to require a party, a senior party official, to be in the C-suite of Google and Facebook and others." What <laughs> what would the response be? And so I think Jamil's absolutely right. We need to stop equating what's going on, like who, the, who has your data doesn't matter. Who has your data absolutely matter. Who knows my secrets matters to me. And so um, I, I, I do think it's really important that we understand the structure of the Chinese engagement with their, the data that comes into to their companies. And I do think we really need to, we need to be honest with ourselves that there is a mercantile system, there's a free market system, they are not the same. And Jamil is absolutely right. We're walking around saying, we're, we're following the rules. Great, China isn't following the rules. In fact, they're doing their level best to change them. And, every, and, and again, he is explicit, saying that he wants to change the rules of financial management in the world. Which way do you think those are gonna go? I mean, so again, what I say is, I think it's critically important that we take a, a fulsome strategic view of all of these literally points of data 
in terms of the relationship of China with our information. And the fact that they have been determined to be a foreign adversary should matter to us differently than a company that isn't determined to be a foreign adversary. I just, yeah, yeah. that's um, baseline stuff for me and my analysis. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we're, we're running up to the last minute here. And um, yeah, sorry, I couldn't get to all the questions, uh, but I would uh, just like to turn over to our host, uh, Nathan, for a few uh, a few concluding remarks. Well, certainly we'll have to have everyone back to continue the discussion. There's lots more to say, uh, but for now, our thanks to Matthew, uh, Jennifer, Jamil, and Margaret for their time and expertise today. Audience feedback is always welcome uh, to RTP at rtp at regproject.org. Have a great day. Thank you.